the wrestling connection, and I did, there were two sports. When I, my, uh, when I was 10, my brother had a pretty severe illness, and, and which really was tough on our family financially, and, and uh, I went into the kind of junior high years a little mixed up and in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was uh, not that far away from reform school, okay. and my best friend ended up in reform school, which, by the way, didn't reform him. He came out yeah. of it a hardened criminal. Right. And wrestling really saved me, cause, cause uh, all of, I, I mean, then you couldn't wrestle, wrestling was for high school, but when I was 10th grade and I was in a fair amount of trouble, I found this sport that I was really good at and made me feel good about myself. Right. And, uh, and right away I broke in with the varsity and got a lot of, you know, sure. acknowledgement. And then that transferred to other things. Once I felt good about myself, mm -hmm. then I started doing well in school and other parts of my life as well. And then I ended up running, I was also cross country runner and wound up getting some athletic scholarships in running mm -hmm. as well as wrestling. Mm -hmm. And then I had to make a choice and I decided to go to the University of North Carolina after high school and um, that's where I was an undergraduate and that's also where I did my uh, doctorate work and I, I wrestled there. Right. When were you in North Carolina, in, in Chapel Hill? Well this when you'll you appreciate. I, I arrived in North Carolina, my idea was Shill and I met when we were 16, and we were very close. And um, here's this daughter of Southern Baptist Appalachian coal miners, yep. and I'm the son of these Eastern European Jews, and it was kind of unlikely coalition, mm -hmm. but we met and became very close. And uh, she was at the University of Kentucky her first year. I was at North Carolina, and then I just couldn't take the separation, and we were married then one week 19, and. We were in Chapel Hill all together from 63, Shill and I, from 63 to 69. And so here's what happens. I'm there and I'm wrestling Division One, which takes time. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, taking an overload of classes and uh, I'm working probably 35 hours a week. I, I made my money reffing sports. Sure. Every kind of sport I would yeah. ref if I, when it wasn't during wrestling season. Right. And... Um, and you know we don't have much money and we're both, both working hard but the history I mean here we are in North Carolina 63 69 the civil rights movement explodes yep. all around us and I say this to high school students all the time and what happens is I'm seeing younger people and older people and African American and white joining in and they're taking on this whole system of, of apartheid, of discrimination, yeah. of denying people service at restaurants, you name it. Right. And people are sitting in and, and we're watching this, we see it. And, and people are getting beat up and acid thrown in their faces, but they're taking on this whole system of blatant discrimination saying, look, <coughs> we are men and women of worth and dignity and substance, we're not gonna, we're not gonna let you do this to us. Mm -hmm. And I say to Sheila, I agree with him, but we don't have any time. Yeah. You know, we're working, going to school, yeah. wrestling. But pretty soon, it's so powerful right. that it forces you to take sides. Sure. You got to decide, quote, yeah. which side you're on. And so we became a small part of that, uh, uh, of the civil rights movement and of anti-hunger and anti-poverty efforts and then the anti-war movement. And... Um, I was, uh, it, I was lucky to be a student at the University of North Carolina, so I did my undergraduate work there at a little under three years, and then I went straight to a doctorate program, hmm. but I also became very involved in all the things that were happening. Interesting. Um, did you happen to remember, you were there when uh, North Carolina signed Charlie Scott. That's right. That's right. Charlie Scott, I actually... Uh, First black to play that's for North Carolina. That's right. Yeah. And uh, initially when I first came there was, could have been Frank McGuire's last year, but Billy Cunningham was the big, the yes. best player yep, then. That's right. that's right. And then, and then Dean Smith, who by the way is a great coach. I'm going to go down to North Carolina. I'm supposed to give, we try to go down once a year to give lectures and, mm. and I am definitely going to, I have never had a chance to sit down with him. And Dean Smith and his wife were very active in the civil rights movement. Yes. This is a remarkable yes. coach and a I remarkable know. person, and I, I want to spend some some uh, time with him. But yet, Charlie Scott came, and and there were a whole bunch of uh, of good teams. North Carolina. Now, I was able to. My only regret 
from an athletics point of view is that the first year, then you couldn't wrestle varsity. You weren't eligible. Right, that's right. And, but I had a good season. I didn't lose any matches, and I was really proud. I beat a guy who was a Pan Am champ uh, who wrestled for the hunt. For the for Fort Bragg, we used mm -hmm. to go down and wrestle Fort Bragg, and then the second year varsity, I I won all the matches, and I went to the Atlantic Coast Conference Championship, and I won that, and then I don't know what I would have been seated, but I probably would have had a good seating for nationals, and I went to see the coach, and I said, you know, we're expecting a child, and I just can't keep doing this. I got to just do more academics, and and he said, you at least should wrestle through the nationals because you're young, and you'll never get a chance to do this again. I said, no, I'm finishing up. So I never went to the Nationals. And I always think, God, I should have participated. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to say on your show, easy to say, well, I could have won it when you right. didn't do it. I right. don't know that that would have happened, but I would have loved to have uh, participated. But we just couldn't afford it any longer. To, mm. There were too many other uh, demands. But mm -hmm. I have, since uh, coming out to Minnesota, uh, we have never missed a a state wrestling tournament mm, interesting. and you know our kids have wrestled and I coached at the junior high school I love coach I'll coach again good good let me uh, say this before we leave North Carolina I lived in Durham from 65 to 67 you know Charcy Hedgepeth oh yes and uh, did you yes and I know Howard Charcy. Fuller yeah. Howard <laughs> I hate to say this I hate to say this but is bragging but Howard uh, is a protege of mine I knew him when he was 14 years old Doesn't in Milwaukee. Me. I'm the reason Howard Fuller came to Durham because I was the only one that knew him. And uh, I worked in, with him in the um, um, North Carolina Fund with a guy named George Esser. And George Esser and there was J uh, John, um, there was somebody else who directed, the, uh, anyway, I know the North Carolina. Yeah, this North is Carolina amazing. Fund. Small and and um, my job was to organize rural tenant farmers and get them into on-the-job training. Mm -hmm. We had OJT then, and I had about 20, about 20 counties in Eastern Carolina mm -hmm. that I had workers in. I, I had about 135 workers. And um, in addition to uh, George Esser, uh, this is, goes back, but um, when Elmer Anderson was governor, Elmer L., mm -hmm. governor of the state of Minnesota, I was the director of the Commission Against Discrimination for Minnesota. He asked me to go with him to the governor's conference in Hershey, Pennsylvania. There, in the middle of the dance floor at one of the parties, I met Terry, uh, Terry Sanford. Terry Sanford. And Terry said to me, he says, you know, you need to come down to North Carolina and work with us. You're a good, you look like you're a good man. I said, well, it's interesting. And then, I would make a long story short, several things happened, and I ended up working for the North Carolina Fund in, sure. in Durham. Terry Sanford was chair of the board. Yeah. And I reminded him of that conversation that we had in um, Hershey, Pennsylvania. So... Our paths crossed, we may well, not have known. Well, for people who are, uh, he, Kwame won't say this, but I'll say about you. First of all, Terry Sanford was one of my, also one oh, of my yeah. heroes, and yep. I love Terry. Um, <coughs> your work was with uh, a lot of the community action in Durham, and what Howard Fuller and others were doing is, this was basically organizing, this was empowerment work. Sure. This was people in the, yeah. this was people, poor people who were basically saying our children have a right to a good education. Right. We have a right to good health care. We want jobs at decent wages. The same kind mm -hmm. of demands right now that are so mm -hmm. important. That was a very, very important work. No, I, I, uh, oh, I, I know your work well. Those, those are some of the best, um, yeah. best years of, of, yeah. of my life yeah. uh, in, I, in Carolina. That well, I still miss, I mean, we wanted to initially, I thought we would stay in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I didn't really want to leave the South. And when I applied, I cannot prove this. I don't want to, I do not want, I've never said this publicly, but I think it's true. And again, I, it's, it's not important any longer, but I never, I just was a small part of the civil rights movement. I was young and had family and was working and, and teaching and I didn't, and working on my dissertation later. And I didn't have the time to put into it that you put into it and others, and, or like John Lewis, who's a real yeah. hero in a, yes. uh, to me. Um, but when I finished up, 
I, I had a hard time. I wanted to teach in the South, and I think one of the things that hurt me when yes. I applied to a lot of Southern universities probably was the activism. And so it ended up being schools like Carleton, yeah. Minnesota, yeah. that were interested. And I said to Sheila, well, listen, I hear this is a good school. Let me go up there for an interview. And I assured her, given the cold weather, because we used to watch the Vikings games, you know, yeah. down there in North Carolina, <laughs> and we'd get the map out, and we'd see the Canadian border, we'd see these people in yeah. snowmobile outfits, and we'd say, those people are out of their minds. That is one place we're never going. We right. said that to each other. Life yeah. is full of mystery, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I said to Sheila, I'm going to go up there, and I'll, let me just check it out. And I, and I went up on a day, well, kind of like today, or I mean, it was, it was 20 above, not 20 below. Right. It, it had just snowed the day before. The sun was out. It was beautiful blue sky, and it was, felt great. Uh -huh. And that was the way it was during my interview in February. So I came back to North Carolina, told people it wasn't that cold in Minnesota, because I'd been there and it wasn't sure, that cold. Sure. And when Carlton offered me this job, I said, we'll go for one year. That was in 1969. I promised you that, right? that we would stay only one year. We'd just go up, see what mm -hmm. it was like, and uh -huh. then we'd get, but then I fell in love with Minnesota. Yeah, well, that, that's <laughs> good. Uh, we're glad you did. <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, Paul, incidentally, I left here three times and have come back three times and have lived in virtually the same neighborhood. And, uh, I, and I, I, uh, sometimes I think this program gets to be a love fest for Minnesota because uh, of the good things that I have had, the experiences and yeah. so forth for me. Well, you have family. done, you have done a lot in Minnesota. I'm sorry, it's your show and I'm supposed to be talking about myself, but here's the point. Uh, I'm also just wrote a chapter called Let Us Now Praise Famous Men and Women, which is after a book by James Agee called Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. Right. I added women, should right. be added. Uh -huh. And my point is that there are people who should be famous for the work they do in the neighborhoods and the communities. Nobody even knows about them, right? Right. Well, you're someone who has built that kind of leadership well, in I our community. Well, I appreciate that. I thank you very much. Um, I've been blessed all along the way to have a family that's supportive, uh, uh, and uh, a son that's carrying on the work, and so I feel good about it. Um, now, you got to Minnesota, and um, you taught uh, how many years at Carleton before you uh, decided, or someone decided for you to run for the Senate? I, was a t I taught at Carleton for about 20 years. Uh -huh. But I, what happened was, to go, let's go back to Durham, North Carolina. Right. What happened was <coughs> my doctoral, my dissertation, I finished up very, pretty young age. I yeah. was 24 and I kind of just Did it. rushed through everything. And, and uh, my dissertation, the title of my dissertation was Black Militancy, Why? Uh -huh. It was a study of Durham, North oh. Carolina. Oh. But here's the problem. Huh. Here's the problem. When I did this study, people in the community said, you know, you're coming over here from that great white university. We've yeah. been studied to death. I know. We're That's sick right. of being used. That's right. What, what are you going to do to improve our community? And I said to Charcy and others who helped me. Yeah. They knew a little bit about me, and they said, he's for real. Yeah. And so I did this study, and I had people in the neighborhood that did the interviewing, and I thought that this dissertation would, would be connected to the betterment of the lives of the people right. I'd studied. And after I finished the dissertation, um, there were articles that I wrote that were accepted and it, I think it would have become a book. But I looked at it and I didn't really feel like it did that. And I pulled the articles, pulled the book, had a falling out of values and decided that, that what I would do if given the chance is that I would use my skills as a teacher and as a writer, as a political scientist, not to stand on the sideline but to kind of be involved with people in struggles for justice. Right, okay. I would kind of use my skills to empower people. So when I came out to Minnesota, what I ended up doing was, I was a teacher at Carlton, but I was involved in so many of the different community struggles around the state. Right. I mean, I got to, uh -huh. I spent so, I, I, I wrote a book about organizing among poor people, poor white people in rural Minnesota, Minnesota. Rice County called uh, how the Rural Poor Got Power, narrative of a grassroots organizer. Mm. And I did a lot of community organizing with lots of people struggling, you mm -hmm. know, and it was in rural poor people, farmers, labor, uh, lot, some work with homeless people, on and on and on. So in a way, for me, it was 20 years of teaching, mm -hmm. writing, traveling, speaking, organizing. Good, And good. that was a good combination. Yes, Along with a little time for coaching. Uh-huh. Incidentally, um, 
Chelsea Hinchpeth is now a lawyer in Atlanta. Is that right? Yeah. She yeah. wouldn't even remember me. I'd love to call her though. Oh, I bet, I bet she'd remember. Oh, me. I just was a little, just a, you know, yes, teeny. She, yes, she, I'm sure she'd remember. I'm gonna tell you what. I'm gonna call her. Yeah, I'm gonna call her. She's in. She's in Atlanta. Um, is that right? The the um, Operation Breakthrough. Yeah.